one more concept specific to fluids. I want to at least introduce it, and we can do some examples next time. I mentioned that if the fluid is moving, that changes the pressure. So I want to look at the equations that relate to fluid flow. Now we are going to look at only idealized situation. The equations that we're going to look at assume a few things. It assumes your fluid is incompressible. So that means the density doesn't change anywhere in the fluid. So even if it goes far down, the density is still the same. And that's perfectly valid for most liquids. Most liquids are really hard to compress. Not as good for gases. Gases are very easy to compress a lot of molecules into a smaller region. We're going to assume the flow is what we call laminar, which just means it's steady, a steady flow. So there's no uh, white water, no rapids, no eddy currents. It's just nice and smooth, perfectly smooth. And that's perfectly fine, even in pipes, for example, as long as there aren't any sharp corners. Sharp corners, you'll get little eddy currents in there. So we'll assume there's no sharp corners. We're also assuming that our fluids are non-viscous. You've probably heard of viscosity before, maybe. Viscosity is a measure of kind of how thick the fluid is. Honey is a fluid, but it's very viscous. All the molecules stick together really easily, so it comes out as a big old glop. Water, not very viscous. It flows very nicely. I've heard that glass is viscous. Glass is viscous, yes. Very, it has a very high viscosity. But yeah, over an extended period of time, the bottom of your glass panes will be thicker than the top ones. And we are assuming one other assumption is that there's no angular momentum. So we're not going to worry about any spinning of any of the molecules. So a lot of assumptions, but realistically still quite applicable if we're talking about, say, water, blood. It's not terribly viscous. So if you did spin the molecules, off, you're putting energy to the outside of the, whatever's containing it, and you're going to reduce energy sometimes. Yeah, you would have more forms of energy. So right, with the assumptions we're making, the only kinetic energy we're going to have is the translational. So by assuming no rotation, we don't have to worry about rotational kinetic energy as well. Okay. So we have two equations. Under those assumptions, if I have a pipe that narrows, and I have fluid flowing through that pipe, Under those assumptions, the flow rate your book uses a capital Q to represent flow rate. Flow rate is the volume per time. So the meters cubed of your fluid per time that are passing any given point in your system. This must be constant in those conditions that we specified. So the same amount of volume per time has to pass by any point. So for example, if I'm looking right here, if I cut out a section, if this volume passed by this point in one second, that same amount of volume would have to pass by the second point in the same amount of time. But the same volume takes up a larger region, or at least a larger length. So in order for the same volume to get through in the same amount of time, what can you tell me about its motion? It has to be traveling faster, otherwise it couldn't do it. Exactly right. So we can write this a different way. Volume, like we said before, the volume is the cross-sectional area times however long that is. So flow rate, Q, can also be written as area times distance over time. But distance over time is velocity, or speed in this case. 
we aren't as concerned with the direction. Okay, this is another heads up. Capital V, capital V over time, volume over time, A times lowercase v, lowercase v is speed. Capital V, volume, lowercase v, speed. Not interchangeable. So we have a couple of variables that we need to watch out for. We have capital P and rho that look similar. And we have capital V and lowercase v. So consider yourself forewarned. So whichever way you use this equation is fine. What this does tell us, which is really nice, is that the area here times the speed of the water, or whatever the fluid happens to be there, has to equal the area over here times the speed of the area over here. So this puts into equation what we just said. We said that since this segment is longer, it had to travel faster to pass this point in the same amount of time. This puts it in perspective. Lower cross-sectional area means it's going to be longer, so it has to travel faster. So as A gets smaller, B gets bigger to maintain the equality. So that's one of the relationships that we have. relationship we have is conservation of energy. It's still the same. Initial potential energy, initial kinetic energy, any work done by external forces. So potential energy, kinetic energy, work, I'm going to write work as force times distance. <coughs> now again, we don't tend to talk about mass when we talk about fluids. We tend to talk about density. So mass is density times volume. I'm going to go ahead and divide every term by volume. That's going to change our units. MGH, 1 half mv squared, force time distance, they were all units of joules, Newton times a meter. We're dividing by volume, which is meters cubed. So basically, by dividing each term by volume, we've given each of these terms units of newtons per meter squared, which is Pascal. So mass per volume is density. Talk about that term in a second. Now volume was a cross-sectional area times distance, so we're basically getting force per area here. Technically, this needs to be some sort of force that causes the area, not the area to change, but it causes a change in volume. The only way the force can change the pressure is if it changes the volume of the material. What this term ends up being is a change in pressure. So what that does, in effect, to the whole equation is it ends up giving us a pressure plus the gravitational potential energy plus the kinetic energy has to equal the pressure at the final point plus the gravitational potential energy plus the kinetic energy. Basically, this quantity must be 
constant. The pressure due to just whatever is pressurizing the system, plus whatever gravitational pressure there is because of any height, plus whatever pressure exists because of moving, that all has to stay constant. So as you look at fluid at one point in a pipe and compare it to fluid, say, in another point of the pipe, the total sum must be the same. It may change, for example, if the pipe narrows and the fluid is moving faster in a second part of the pipe, this term is going to get bigger. Something else has to get smaller to maintain the equality. This is where it gets smaller. So this, this is called Bernoulli's equation. It's basically the conservation of energy for fluids. P, capital P, is the absolute pressure in the pipe, or whatever you're looking at in terms of the fluid. Flowing. Huh? V? Feet. Row. Row. I was wondering where you're getting feet free from. I'm like, we haven't talked about feet today. <laughs> yeah, row. Row is the density. It is common to need to use both of these relationships in any one given problem. You may not have to, but it is common to need to. Keep in mind, these terms have units of Pascal's. So when you put your absolute pressures, your pressures at those points, they need to be in Pascal's as well. In order to mathematically manipulate the equation.